on World News Tonight. Surprise denial. Pakistan's president denies granting more authority to the military forces with the firm rejection of new laws. Climate emergency. Hurricane Hillary wreaks havoc in California as the state struggles against its first tropical storm in a decade. Mission failed. Russia's shot for a space legacy turns sour with the Luna 25 model crashing on impact with the moon's surface. And modern metropolis. South Africa's Johannesburg sees cultures from across the globe with the 15th BRICS Summit kicking off. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Hello, good evening, and you are joining us on World News. We begin tonight in Pakistan, where controversy surrounds its incumbent president. In a dramatic turn of events, Pakistan's president Arif Alvi denied approving two controversial bills which further enhance the military's powers. The two laws make it an offence to reveal the identities of military intelligence officers and also propose jail terms for defaming the army. Pakistani President Arif Alvi denied having signed two crucial bills and accused his staff of having undermined his will and command. In a post on X, the president said he asked his staff to return the bills, the Official Secrets Act Amendment Bill 2023 and the Pakistan Army Amendment Bill 2023, unsigned within the stipulated time to make them ineffective. Both the bills, which give authorities more power to prosecute people for acts against the state and military, were approved by the lower and upper house and sent to the president for his approval. According to the constitution, if the president does not sign a draft bill or return it back with objections within 10 days after approval from the two houses, it will become law. Alvi is a member of former Prime Minister Imran Khan's Pakistan Tariq e Insaf party, which opposes the coalition government that passed the two bills. Two of its leaders, Shah Mahmood Qureshi and Assad Umar, were arrested under Official Secrets Act for disclosing the contents of a diplomatic cipher. The law ministry, meanwhile, termed the president's claim against the spirit of the constitution. It is said in a statement that the president has no third option but to either sign a bill or return to the parliament with specific observations. The PTI termed the development concerning and unimaginable and said it will take the matter to the Supreme Court. Senator Ifran Siddiqui from Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, which headed the previous government, said the president should step down if his staff did not listen to him. Now over in the U.S., a state of emergency has been declared as tropical storm Hillary churns into California with forecasters warning of catastrophic and life-threatening flooding. And the mayor of Los Angeles calling it an unprecedented weather event. More than 42 million Americans are now under tropical storm warnings. Storm Hillary is one for the history books. For the first time in 84 years, Southern California is bracing itself for a tropical storm, with warnings of catastrophic and life-threatening flooding. If you do not need to be on the roadways, we are asking you to postpone any of your non-essential travel until the peak of the storm passes. The hurricane started off in Manzanillo, off the coast of Mexico, bringing with her flash floods, high winds and power outages. Forecasters say she's now quickly approaching Southern California, including LA, and if the storm moves inland, the rainfall could spread to Nevada. In the meantime in California, preemptive measures are underway, like these makeshift sandbags as key defences. But this alone may not be enough. And evacuations may be necessary. What well, we ask all Angelinos, just as we live in earthquake country, and to be prepared to leave and be prepared to sustain yourself over the next 72 hours. And it looks like preparations are well underway. Empty shelves, full trolleys and panicked shoppers can be found in supermarkets across California. This is unprecedented, so it's sort of unbelievable. A tropical storm will be fine. A little bit of sandbags and some careful you know, planning. I would say get some water and get some canned food, but I'm not personally worried about it. I mean, a lot of people here are excited because the waves are going to get pretty, pretty heavy. But um, I mean, it's going to be some rain. So, you know, usually there's some flooding and the landslides and things like that. Storm Hillary is the latest major climate disaster in the U.S. Just last week, 114 people died after wildfires in Maui and Hawaii. 
And in Canada's British Columbia, almost 400 fires are raging. Back in California, the coming hours are critical as Americans wait to see what happens next. Now, Canada is bracing for its worst wildfire season. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said that Canada is sending the military to tackle fast-spreading wildfires in British Columbia as the Western province deals with flames that have led to evacuation orders for more than 35,000 people. They know wildfires in Canada, but not like this. Fires this year are the worst in recent history. As they advance through rural land, they threaten population centres. British Columbia has declared a state of emergency. People in the western province have been forced to flee the area. Thousands are subject to an evacuation order. Thousands more have been told to be ready to move. British Columbians know uh, that right now we are facing the worst wildfire season in our province's history. Uh, this unprecedented situation has come to a head this evening. Uh, in uh, just the last 24 hours, the situation has evolved and deteriorated quite rapidly. This was smoke in the sky over the city of Kelowna in British Columbia, as Canada's Prime Minister spoke of a summer of incredible difficulty. The federal government is uh, closely coordinating with, with the province of BC and we will be there uh, to add to whatever resources uh, BC has uh, and uh, we're all going to get through uh, this incredibly difficult summer together. These were the scenes in Yellowknife, the capital city of Canada's Northwest Territories. 20,000 residents were given a weekend deadline to leave the city for their own safety. Thousands took to the road, others were evacuated by air. Canadian military planes joined the effort. A chart of Canadian wildfires through the years vividly reflects the spike seen this year. More than 14 million hectares have been burned. That's twice the previous record in 1989. Long-term drought conditions and record high temperatures are cited as factors by Canadian authorities who warn of a still unpredictable situation with difficult days ahead. Meanwhile, financial woes loom for China as China's central bank has cut one of its key interest rates for the second time in three months as the world's second largest economy struggles to bounce back from the pandemic. The People's Bank of China cut the one-year loan prime rate, a benchmark for corporate loans, from 3.55% to 3.45%. The central bank held the five-year LPR, which is used to price mortgages, steady at 4.2%. China's post-COVID recovery has been hampered by weakening demand for Chinese goods due to the uncertain global economic outlook and domestic challenges ranging from a slumping property market to a record low birth rate. Growing fears that property giant Country Garden may default on its debt have raised concerns about potential contagion in China's financial system after major developer Evergrande defaulted on more than $300 billion in debt in 2021. China also announced it would no longer publish detailed youth employment figures after the jobless rate hit 21.3% in June. The rate cut was greeted with disappointment by some market analysts who have been holding out hope for bolder measures to boost the economy. Goldman Sachs economist Maggie Wei in a note described the LPR cut as disappointing, adding that it would not help with building confidence. As Chinese authorities pursue an economic recovery, the move can even backfire if market participants interpret these easing measures as policymakers' unwillingness to deliver even moderate policy stimulus. Wei said the move can even backfire if market participants interpret these easing measures as policymakers' unwillingness to deliver even moderate policy stimulus. Beijing acknowledged economic difficulties but blasted Western commentators for doubting the country's growth prospects. A blow to Russia's space ambitions as the country's space agency confirmed that Russia's first lunar mission in decades has ended in failure with its Lunar 25 spacecraft crashing into the moon's surface. This leaves India's Chandrayaan-3 on course to become the first spacecraft to land near the lunar south pole. Russia's first moon mission in 47 years has failed. The Lunar 25 spacecraft spun out of control and crashed into the moon after a problem preparing for pre-landing orbit. 
Russia's state space corporation, Roscosmos, said it had lost contact with the craft at 11.57 GMT on Saturday. In a statement, it said, quote, The apparatus moved into an unpredictable orbit and ceased to exist as a result of a collision with the surface of the moon. It added that a special interdepartmental commission had been formed to investigate the reasons behind the loss of Luna 25. The mission had raised hopes in Moscow that Russia was returning to the big power moon race. But this failure has underscored the decline of Russia's space power since the glory days of Cold War competition. <laughs> Moscow had been the first to launch a satellite to orbit the Earth in 1957, and Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man to travel into space in 1961. Russia had not attempted a moon mission since Luna 24 in 1976. It's been racing against India, whose spacecraft is scheduled to land on the moon's south pole this week. It also faces competition from China and the United States, which both have advanced lunar ambitions. Luna 25's failure means that Russia may not be the first to sample the frozen water which scientists believe the south pole of the moon holds. It was not immediately clear what long-term impact the failed mission would have on the country's moon programme. The crash comes as Russia's $2 trillion economy faces its biggest external challenge for decades. The pressure of both Western sanctions and fighting the most significant land war in Europe since World War II. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now over in Ecuador, elections are set to go to a second round in a vote dominated by security concerns overshadowed by the assassination of anti-corruption candidate Fernando Villavicencio, who was shot dead as he left a campaign rally. Flanked by heavy security, Christian Zurita, the Ecuadorian who replaced his slain anti-corruption candidate Fernando Villavicencio, cast his vote in the country's presidential election on Sunday. Guards held up a bulletproof blanket to shield Zarita. Security has taken center stage since the August 9th murder of Villa Vincencio, a former investigative journalist and lawmaker who was gunned down while leaving a campaign event. Other candidates reported attacks against them during the campaign, though in some cases, police have said the violence was not directed at the hopefuls themselves. Authorities have said 100,000 police and military personnel will be on hand to guard polling places. Candidates have pledged to fight sharp increases in crime and improve the struggling economy amid a rise in unemployment and migration. Voters at the polls in Quito and Guayaquil told that security was their major focus. The 13 million strong electorate will also choose 137 members of the National Assembly and vote on two environmental referendums. Voting is mandatory for those between 18 and 65. A candidate needs 50% of the vote or 40% if they are 10 points ahead of their nearest rival to win in the first round. If that doesn't happen, a second round will be held on October 15th. Now, in what seems to be a response to the Seoul-Washington joint military drills, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un inspected a Navy unit and observed a cruise missile test. But the South Korean military said parts of the claims made regarding strategic cruise missiles appear to be exaggerated. As military forces from South Korea and the U.S. kicked off their annual summertime drills on Monday, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un oversaw the test firing of strategic cruise missiles from a Navy ship. The North state-run media said Monday that the regime's leader visited a Navy fleet stationed on the East Coast to inspect the test from aboard a warship. The news outlet added that the launch was aimed at carrying out an attack mission in actual war and said the missile precisely hit its target. This comes only three days after the leaders of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan agreed to strengthen security ties at a trilateral summit. But the North is yet to respond to the recent summit, with experts saying Kim's move appears to be a show of force against the combined military exercise. The launch was conducted right after the trilateral summit between South Korea, the US and Japan, and right before the Ulshi Freedom Shield exercise, so it's probably a strong warning that it will respond sternly against the military drills. The expert also said the North will likely release a comprehensive review after looking at how China and Russia are responding to the summit, 
as well as the public opinion in South Korea, the U.S., and Japan. Meanwhile, South Korea's military said parts of North Korea's claim to have fired strategic cruise missiles are not true and appear to have been exaggerated. It added that Seoul and Washington detected signs of the test in advance and had been monitoring the situation in real time. It said the military plans to thoroughly conduct the joint drills under a strong combined defense posture while maintaining capabilities strong enough to respond to any provocation from the North. An official from Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff told reporters that it was a ship-to-ship -ship missile, not a strategic cruise missile, noting that it's impossible to launch that kind of cruise missile from such a small ship. The official also added that the missile did not hit its target. Moving on to the road to the White House, where the former President Donald Trump, who faces several court cases, claims he is so well known among the public that he does not need to participate in the upcoming debates. The frontrunner for the Republican nomination in the 2024 presidential election confirmed that he will not join the Republican primary debates. Trump has for months suggested he would skip the debate in the Midwestern city of Milwaukee, arguing that he was well known among the U.S. public, so it did not make sense to give his Republican rivals a chance to attack him. A CBS poll showed he was the preferred candidate for 62 percent of Republican voters, with his closest rival Florida Governor Ron DeSantis at 16 percent. The other candidates in the party's race for the nomination had less than 10 percent support. Trump's absence from the debate could leave DeSantis the focus of attacks from other candidates looking to position themselves as the primary alternative to the former president. The winner of the Republican nomination will take on Democratic President Joe Biden in the November 2024 election. DeSantis' campaign spokesperson Andrew Romeo said the Florida governor was looking forward to being in Milwaukee to share his vision for a possible presidency. A team that endured all that Spain has in the past 12 months should not be able to win a World Cup. And yet that is precisely what it did as Spain's women's national football team won their first World Cup, defeating England 1-0. However, the joy did not last long as it was later reported that Spain's winning scorer captain Olga Carmona was informed that her father had passed away. Carmona scored the only goal in a 1-0 victory over England. Spain has won the Women's World Cup for the first time after beating England 1-0 in the final. Captain Olga Carmona scored the only goal in the 29th minute after England lost possession in midfield. <coughs> Spanish supporters gathered at the Wizik Centre in Madrid, where a large screen broadcasted the exhilarating match. <laughs> This is for women's soccer, for women's history. They deserve it. We must keep pushing and giving visibility. It's hard for us to fill up stadiums. Now it's going to be crazy. We're just a step away from men now. As the referee blew the final whistle, marking the triumph, the elated crowd roared in celebration. English fans, however, were left in tears by their defeat. But former England women's player Janet Bagley hopes for a future win for the Lionesses. Gutted, absolutely gutted, but still very proud. I thought they did a, 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 a amazing fight and they, they could come back to this country with their heads held very high. It'll happen, it'll definitely happen in the next, in the next one, four years time, we'll win it. Spain and England played a final match in front of more than 75,000 fans at Stadium Australia. Co-hosted by Australia and New Zealand, the ninth edition of a global showpiece event was the first to be held in the Southern Hemisphere. Both teams were making their first appearance at a Women's World Cup final. England still awaits its first trophy since the men's tournament in 1966. Welcome back after more news of Tokyo around the world in a minute. 
Kazakhstan president was officially welcomed to Vietnam by his counterpart Vietnamese President Vo Van Tong with the countries hoping to boost bilateral ties, particularly trade and economic relations. Sales of electric cars in Indonesia jumped after the government launched tax incentives and the nation's chief economics minister said he hoped that Indonesia's largest scale auto show would drive sales of more than 26,000 EVs. Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen said Denmark will supply Ukraine with 19 F-16 fighters during a joint news conference with Ukraine's president at the Skystrup Air Base in Denmark. Maui continues to grapple the aftermath of the devastating fire where the destruction caused by the fire remains severe with no cleanup efforts initiated yet. However, the Federal Emergency Management Agency has taken action by deploying large-scale cleanup equipment to clear the significant debris left behind. Cambodia's King Norodom Shiamoni inaugurated the parliament as he witnessed the beginning of a new era with outgoing PM Hun Shen set to transfer his leadership to his son Hun Mane after decades in the reign. And that is all we have for you tonight on World News. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight as the 15th BRIC Summit is set to kick off in Johannesburg, South Africa, an inclusive city embracing diverse cultures. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.